Parker joined uh, Hyundai of, of America in 2022. Well, no, he became CEO in 2022, I should say, after first joining in 2019 as the vice president of sales. Um, he, in his tenure as vice president of sales, he really accomplished some pretty amazing things. Hyundai became one of the fastest growing mainstream brands. They had record sales, all time record sales in 2021, and they've had 31% growth in market share since 2020. Pretty amazing in what is a very competitive industry. When he became CEO, he also became the first black CEO of a major automotive organization in the United States. We are very, well, and he came, I should say this too, after a lot of history in the automotive industry. So he spent over three decades with Nissan and General Motors as well. We are very proud to say that Randy is a graduate of TCU. He has a Bachelor's of Science, go Frogs. And, um, and while he was here, he played basketball, part of the team that got the nickname of the Killer Frogs. Um, right, so now I think killer frog sometimes has some other connotations that go with it, but it came back, it started with Randy and his teammates. Um, Randy was born in Nuremberg, Germany, very interesting, but he considers Texas his home uh, as a native of Texas. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Randy Parker. Man, thank you for that welcome. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, you know, and another really important thing that I forgot to mention is, so, like I said, it's, I've been trying to get him on this stage for a year. But in that year, he volunteered to mentor two students in our Neely Mentorship Program. Well, think about that. Can you imagine when you were an undergraduate being able to say, oh, yeah, I was mentored by the CEO of Hyundai. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. I'm not sure what that means, but. Uh, <laughs> and I think we have one of those students here today. Yeah, where's Alex? Hey, there's Alex. Let's give Alex a round of applause. <laughs> and the other one would have been here today, but. Asher. Studying abroad. You studying know. abroad. I mean, so. you know, hey, you know. But uh, it's glad to, uh, I'm glad to, glad to be back on campus. Yeah, well, yeah this place so has changed quite a bit. You. It's beautiful. Um, actually, I have to say, before we get started, I'm a little bit nervous. Don't be. I, I am, actually, because I got a lot of. Um, Teammates, football players, fraternity brothers that uh, that are sitting in the audience. They know me quite well. Nothing like speaking in front of people that uh, you kind of grew up with that know everything about you. <laughs> <sighs> so uh, anyway, um, so, well, Dixon, he... Dixon asked me last night, he said, what, you know, he asked me on Sunday, actually. He said, hey, what time do you go on stage? I said, 10 o'clock. He said, OK, I'm going to join you. <laughs> Damn it, he figured out that uh, I'm on early. Because <laughs> I, I didn't want him to be in the back heckling me. Right? <laughs> Well, it's so teammates, friends, if, if he gets anything wrong, just shout out in the middle of the conversation and let us know. Absolutely. <laughs> so before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. I, of course, always want to thank our sponsors. So long-term platinum sponsor, Frost Bank. Um, gold sponsor, Fort Worth Business Press. Um, we have silver sponsors, Balcom Agency and Limbeck. Bronze sponsors, Acme Brick. BNSF Railway, Dunaway, Esri, McDonald Sanders, Perkins and & Will, and Weaver. And I will also just point out, as I always do, that on your, <coughs> your, um, your tables there are some cards and some pens. And so we will try to finish just a little bit early so that you have time to, so we have time to ask some of your questions of Randy. And so, I don't know, like maybe 15 minutes before 9, um, we will have somebody come through the audience, pick up those cards, and bring them to me. So as you think of questions as we are talking up here today, just jot them down and you'll get a chance to ask a little bit later. Sounds great. So let's just jump straight into this first question. Let's do this. Okay. 
So tell us about <coughs> your personal background with your education and educational and career journey. So you have some really exciting global experiences besides just being born in Nuremberg. Correct. Um, you, as you mentioned, you've got some really strong athletic ties to the Horton Frogs. And I suspect that probably both of those things and all kinds of other things experienced who you are now as, as a professional and a leader. Yeah, 100%. Well, it, uh, it all started here, obviously, right? So um, I graduated uh, TCU, class of 88. Um, as uh, as uh, Dr. Richardson pointed out, I played basketball uh, from 84 through, uh, through 88. Uh, unfortunately, I had to play behind Jamie Dixon. Uh, that, was my, uh, that was my biggest challenge, right? Because this guy, was, uh, he, was a, he was a real killer frog, but uh, very, very proud of Jamie and uh, what Jamie's been able to accomplish over the years. But uh, uh, nevertheless, it started right here, you know? And um, it started um, with a job fair. Um, probably like a, a, a lot of the students uh, in the audience, you probably don't know exactly what it is you want to do in life. I was the exact same way. You know, I was a, a criminal justice major and thought I, uh, I was going to go into uh, law enforcement. Um, I was hoping I was going to go into, uh, you know, working for the FBI, the CIA, the DEA. I had a friend of mine that uh, graduated from TCU. Uh, he was a police officer in Dallas and uh, now uh, uh, just retired from, uh, from the DEA. And I thought I was going to follow in the exact same footsteps. And, um, there was a job fair on campus, and um, you know all the big companies were here. So uh, EDS, Frito Lay, PepsiCo, um, and I happened to walk by a booth, and it said GMAC, General Motors Acceptance Corporation, and I knew the brand because that's uh, that was the company that my dad made his car payment to, right? And back then, I'm showing sure my age now, um, you uh, you made your car payment through a coupon book. You know, you tore off the monthly coupon, you write out the check and you send in your, uh, your, your car payment. You know, today, obviously, you guys probably do it online, right? Well, back then, you put it in the mail. And so uh, I knew the brand, right? And so I walked over and said, hey, I know you guys. And my dad makes his car payment to you guys every month. They say, hey, come over and talk to us, right? And so anyway, I gave him my, uh, my resume. And uh, 34 years later, I'm in the auto industry. So uh, as, you, as you pointed out, uh, I've worked for three different car companies. So uh, General Motors. Um, Nissan and now uh, Hyundai. So I, uh, I worked for GM for about uh, 18 years, started in finance. Even though I was a CJ major, major I started in finance. I worked for GMAC for, uh, for about four years. Then I transitioned over to the sales and marketing side uh, with uh, Chevrolet and I was with uh, Chevy for about 18 years. Then I transitioned to uh, Nissan, worked at Nissan for, uh, for seven years. Um, and then I uh, saved the best for last. I uh, now work for Hyundai as you, as you clearly pointed out. Um, I've moved 14 times. Um, I've lived in four different states, so Texas, Michigan, California, Tennessee, and I worked, uh, worked abroad in Japan uh, for two years. And uh, so I've got a pretty uh, checkerboard background. I've been married uh, to my lovely bride for 32 years. Um, my kids are ages uh, 29. <laughs> thank you, thank you. My wife, uh, she'll really appreciate that you guys uh, clap for her this morning. I'll let her know. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got three, three beautiful kids, ages uh, 29, 27, 25. They're all doing well. Um, you know, for those of you that are thinking about getting married and juggling two careers, it can be done. Um, it's very challenging, very difficult. I think on five different occasions, my wife and I, we lived in uh, two separate locations, mm -hmm. uh, but we figured out a way to make it work. And I gotta tell you, I mean, we're, uh, we're, we're as close as ever. We're a very, very close-knit family. And, you know, uh, making those sacrifices led me to where I am today. Um, but it, it, it didn't have, I would say, a negative impact uh, on the family unit. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been a great ride. That's phenomenal. Um, and I love that story. I also have to say, I feel like this has been kind of a theme across a lot of our test speakers, um, students in the audience, right? You don't, you come to college, you think you know what you're gonna do, and right, your journey after you leave here can take you anywhere. Can take you, I, I mean, I, I would say I'm, I'm the example of uh, the American dream, right? Um, you know, again, I, I thought I was going to go into law enforcement and, you know, I never thought I was going to be the CEO of anything, you know, to be quite honest with you. And uh, just over time, it just, it just led me to this place, you know. But make no mistake about it, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's about having a passion for what you do. Um, it's about performing. Um, um, it's about putting points up on the board, you know. Uh, as Dixon will tell you, you know, sometimes coaches will say, um, it's defense that wins uh, championships. You know, I call bullshit, uh, to be quite honest with you. Because at the end of the day, Dixon's got to outscore the opponent, right? Defense can, 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 uh, can hold up things, you know, for a, a certain period of time, but, but you still got to outscore the opponent. You know, defense needs to show up every once in a while and make a play when you need them to make a play, but at the end of the day, when you look at the scoreboard, um, you got to put points up on the board, and uh, it's the same thing in business. Um, you've got to perform, and uh, 
um, you know, being as competitive as I am over the years, I think that's what really got me to this place, right? Because uh, in the auto industry, whether you know it or not, we run in 30-day increments, we run in uh, quarterly increments, half-year increments, and then full-year in uh, increments. And uh, we chase KPIs every, every 30 days. And uh, I like to see my name in light, so uh, it, was, uh, it was really fun. <laughs> okay, now we, we now know the underlying motivating factor. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so you are leading Hyundai Motors of America right now. Uh, and you know what, let's actually establish this. How do you say it? Hyundai like Sunday. Hyundai like Sunday, okay. All that's right. good Hyundai to like know. Sunday, that's the easiest okay. thing I can tell you. It's Hyundai, you know, uh, the Korean way, but uh, the American way, Hyundai okay. like Sunday. Okay, Hyundai like Sunday, that's good. Right? Okay, there's now like 200 pe more people who can say it correctly now. <laughs> um, Okay, Hyundai is known for a company as a f company focused on the future of transportation and mobility solutions, not only automotive sales, as I indicated earlier, and of course, our, as, as Megan mentioned, our theme today is modernizing business uh, for the progress of humanity. So can you tell us broadly what that means to you for employees, for strategy, for just whatever? <clears throat> Very good question. So let me, let me, let me start here. Um, I want to start with our uh, executive chair, Mr. Chung. Uh, Mr. Chung is our uh, third generation owner of the company. Um, he was educated uh, in the United States. In fact, he was educated in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. So he's got sort of that uh, Silicon Valley uh, mindset, uh, entrepreneurial mind uh, mindset. And for him, it's more than just a sheet metal. Uh, for him, it's all about um, uh, making progress for humanity. That is our, uh, I would say, our global vision for the company. Um, it guides everything we do from product design to product development um, to the actions that we take as a corporate citizen. And um, uh, it's all about improving the human journey of life. I mean, what car company, you know, can, can do that or say that, right? Um, so let me give you some really good examples. <clears throat> um, Mr. Chung has transformed the company from a traditional car company to a uh, mobility solutions company. Um, we dabble in uh, electrification, hydrogen propulsion, hybrid technology. Um, connectivity, uh, autonomous driving systems. So we've got robo taxis right now in Las Vegas that are driving around. I mean, just imagine that uh, one day you'll be able to jump in a car with no driver. Sounds pretty far-fetched, right? But, uh, you know, 30 years ago, no one thought about the iPhone, right? And so those are the things that we, we get into. Um, another really good example is um, um, uh, back in 2020, we purchased uh, Boston Dynamics. Uh, which is a, a robotic company. Uh, back then we purchased it for about uh, 880 million. I think it's valued at uh, 1.1 billion right now. So a really good investment. Yeah. Um, but why would a car company invest in a robotics technology company? Um, again, it's to improve the human journey of life. Um, I've seen paraplegics use robotic skeletons to walk again, which is very, very touching. Um, I've seen robotics, uh, robotic technology help line workers on the, uh, uh, on the manufacturing floor use less energy as they uh, build the car, as an example. And so, you know, through that process, you learn a lot, you know, and as I said earlier, for uh, Mr. Chung, it's, it's not about the sheet metal, it's not about the money, it's about, you know, improving the well-being of, uh, uh, of human life. Another really good example of uh, what we do is our philanthropic initiative, Hyundai Hope on Wheels. Mm -hmm. um, Hyundai Hope on Wheels was started back in uh, 1998 by a small group of New England area Hyundai dealers who wanted to support the, uh, the local children's hospital against the, uh, the fight against uh, pediatric cancer. Mm -hmm. Fast forward uh, 25 years later, this past year, we donated $25 million in the fight against pediatric cancer. This year, to commemorate our 26 year anniversary, we're gonna donate $26 million uh, in the fight against pediatric cancer. Um, I've been to the hospitals. Um, I spent a, a lot of time with the kids. Uh, again, this is a car company, and yet we're uh, in the fight against pediatric cancer. And uh, uh, for me, th th it, it excites me to come to work every day. This is why uh, I, I'm excited about working for a company like Hyundai because, again, it's more than just, you know, driving a Tucson or an Elantra or an EV product or a Palisade or the all-new Santa Fe. Um, it's about doing other things and becoming a fabric of the community. And so um, that's, that's, that's uh, progress for humanity. Yeah. I'm gonna, so we're, we're gonna ask a question a little bit about later about what it's like working for a Korean company, but I, I would just like to say I love Hyundai as such an incredible success story and illustration of, of the way business has globalized over the last several decades. 
right? There is a, I, I, so I teach international management mm, okay. and uh, <clears throat> I, I often talk about Hyundai in class and I think we could all think back to a time where if you ask the typical American, would you buy a car made in North Korea? And they'd be like, heck no. <laughs> um, and right now it's one of the most successful brands in this country and in doing so much more. It's just a phenomenal organization. No, you're absolutely right. You know, um, fast forward 73 years. So let's go back to 1953, okay? Um, during the Korean War. And by the way, my father fought in Korea. Uh, very, very proud of the fact. And uh, in 1953, Korea was basically flattened. There was nothing there. I mean, it was basically raised. And out of the ashes, the phoenix rises. And uh, you fast forward 73 years later, and this place is a booming metropolis. Anybody in the audience ever been to Seoul, Korea? Okay, so a couple. Uh, when's the last time? March of last year. Yeah. Does it look like a 73-year-old uh, country? No. Looks like it's been there forever, right? Yeah. And so um, you think about that, 73 years. And you, just to put things in perspective, you know, America, we're over, what, a couple hundred years, mm -hmm. right? 73 years, and now you've got a booming metro metropolis. And that's part of the, uh, the Korean culture. It's about moving fast, go fast. There's something that uh, we call pali pali. It means go. Uh, and then there's another uh, uh, cliche that we use. It's called habuja, have you tried? Um, at, at, at Hyundai, anything is possible. Um, and again, if you think about uh, um, that type of culture, that culture of pali pali, move, go fast, mm -hmm. take the initiative, um, that's really what we're all about. I'll give you a really good example. So we've got two divisions, right? We've got Hyundai and we've got Genesis. Genesis is our uh, luxury division. Mm -hmm. um, it's only been in market now for, for a few years. Um, and right now we're trying to uh, rewire the house while the lights are on because we're trying to separate the two brands, right, and make Genesis a true luxury yeah. division. Very, very hard thing to do, but nevertheless, we started out with 800 dealers. Today we've got 230, and we want to get down to 100. Um, and so we're doing a really good job of separating. In hindsight, if you think about a, uh, an American company or a Japanese company or a German company, they would have probably analyzed themselves to death <clears throat> and obviously, I've worked for an American car company. I've worked for a Japanese car company. And uh, it may have talked ourselves out of it. You know, like, oh, maybe it's too much trouble, you know, to uh, bring a luxury car division to uh, the United States and, you know, blah, 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 right? And so, um, but what, what Hyundai did was they took a luxury division. They saw an opportunity. We've got 830 Hyundai dealers in the United States. Let's start selling Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so I asked the question, you know, um, well, why did you guys do that? Why didn't you just launch it separately to begin with, right? Instead of now trying to, you know, unwind things because it's complicated. Yeah. And uh, the first thing they said, no, Randy, you know, the first year we sold 20,000 Genesis. Okay, but yeah, now look what we're doing. Yeah, yeah but, but Randy, it's okay. The second year we sold 35,000 Genesis. Yeah, but now look at all the trouble that we're going through. Randy, it's okay. Last year we sold 85,000 Genesis. And meanwhile, we're still trying to separate the brands. And so we're well on our way to selling 200,000 units in, uh, in the United States and becoming a true tier one luxury division on the Genesis side. But again, that's the, uh, that's the culture. That's the mentality. Poly poly, go fast. You see an opportunity, take it. You know? And, um, and uh, as an employee of the company, that's pretty refreshing. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great story. OK. So you have mentioned before that um, there are maybe two prongs of, of the business, employee development and the business of strategy that are, are critical. So let's talk about that first prong, employee development. So can you share with us a little bit about your style as a leader and how you prepare and develop employees for success in today's workplace? <sighs> Excellent question. Um, I would say that um, I'm 80% a servant leader. 20% coach. Okay. Um, my job is to help you achieve your objectives. If you're achieving your objectives, in essence, I'm going to achieve my objectives. My job is to uh, ensure that you have the resources to do your job. Uh, my job is to ensure that um, you have the right proper training to do your job. Um, my job is to get you to do things that you didn't think you were capable of doing with enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. um, that's my job. Uh, I, re I remove impediments, I remove obstacles, I'm an uh, expert problem solver, and, and, and I'm never going to ask you to do, do something that, that I wouldn't do myself, or that I haven't done myself, or that we can't do together right now. Mm -hmm. um, Ira, who's uh, my teammate here from, uh, from PR, 
Um, if you ask Ira, Ira will say, yeah, I work for Randy. Well, no, I, Ira doesn't work for me. Ira and I work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm levels above Ira, but so what? It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, we're teammates, right? I can't do my job unless uh, I get him to do his job and do it really, really well, right? Because, uh, again, I want to I wanna make sure that uh, the employees are thriving, um, that, uh, that they're getting promoted, that they're earning the bonuses, that their uh, stock, uh, stock options are going through the roof so that you can provide for your families. You can educate your kids and send your kids to TCU. Um, so that's, that's my job uh, as a servant leader. Um, it's, it's you before me. And then the other 20%, it's all about coaching, you know. Um, uh, it's about employee engagement. We um, just recently won an award in Orange County as a, a great place to work. Uh, we're a workplace of choice. Uh, I take a lot of pride in that. Um, but for me, it's all about teamwork and collaboration, which are things that uh, I, I learned when I was playing basketball right here at TCU mm -hmm. and, uh, and being part of the uh, TCU family. And, uh, you know, it's pretty cool that I've got football players like uh, Rodney and Patrick in the back uh, that are here joining me this morning. And, you know, Dixon is here, former teammate of mine, and uh, my uh, fraternity brothers that are here as well. They're somewhere in the audience. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. There they are. There's a, where's Horatio? Oh, there's Horatio. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty cool, you know, that uh, I've got uh, all these different communities, you know, supporting me. And, and, and honestly speaking, that's really what, that's really what it's all about. Um, employees drive experiences. Experiences drive um, leadership. Leadership drives culture and then culture drives performance. And uh, that's my job, is to establish you know, a proper culture within the organization. Uh, if we're gonna become a high impact, high performance uh, organization, it's all about culture. It's about, it's a, it's about having a winning culture and um, uh, a high performance culture. I mean, when I was playing basketball here at TCU, we won the Southwest Conference in 86 and 87. And uh, one thing that uh, Coach Killingsworth used to tell us all the time was that, hey, you guys aren't very good. Am I lying? He said that, right? A little different word. <laughs> a couple of, some, some four-letter uh, words uh, sprinkled in between, right? But he would say to us, yeah, you, you guys aren't very good. You're not very athletic. You're going to have to work together as a team to beat, you know, people like U of H and Phi Slam and Jam and Arkansas and UT and, you know, all those teams that we played against uh, back in the day. And, you know, we won the Southwest Conference two years in a row, 86 and 87, played in the NCAA tournament, went to the second round. You know, right now Jamie's trying to crack through that uh, second round. You're going to do it one day. Uh, I'm right there behind you, right? But uh, again, it's about teamwork. It's about uh, having that proper esprit de corps. And as a leader, that's my job to help establish that culture within uh, Hyundai. Uh, I love what you, the way you characterize yourself as a leader and what leadership is about. And we do record these. I'm going to play some of that back to our new dean. I think he gets it already, but I'm like, oh, we need to remember that. <laughs> but I love the way where you... I think so often we think about a leader as someone who, like, they're up here, they've got all the power, right? I go in and I tell you what to do, and, right, it's a two-way street. You're Absolutely. not a leader if nobody's following you. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Absolutely. No, I play, uh, I play the Pied Piper a lot, you know, and, um, um, you know, for me it's all about employee engagement. When you look at the value chain of uh, profitability, the first link in that value chain, if I ask a lot of people that question, they say, oh, it's the product. Right? Everything starts with the product. And, you know, and that's true because at the end of the day, um, nothing happens in my business until I do what? Until I sell a car. Right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think, hey, it's all about the product first. But when I think about the value chain of profitability, um, for me, it's all about employee engagement. It's about the employees. Um, the employees are you know, our competitive advantage in the marketplace. Uh, and if I've got you know, 2,000 happy, engaged uh, employees, that's how we're going to become a, a tier one brand. That's how we're going to be Toyota. That's how we're going to be Honda. That's how we're going to be Ford and General Motors. We're now, we're now ranked fifth in the United States in terms of uh, market share. And, we're, and as you pointed out, we're growing. We set record sales in uh, 21, 22, 23, and I guarantee you this is going to be another record year. So, um, but it all starts with the employees. You know? One of my favorite leader, leaders is uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. And one thing that uh, Napoleon did really, really well, he knew in order for him to when the battles that he fought was he needed to keep his troops fed. Mm -hmm. And if you heard what I said earlier, it's about you first and me second, right? I want to make sure that you're fed. I want to make sure that you're very well taken care of. I'm, I want to make sure that, that you're happy to come to work every day uh, because you spend 80% of the time at work, the other 20% of the time thinking about work. So you better be happy in the place that you work and the people that you work with, right? So that's my job is to create that culture, right? And so. You know, being nominated as a uh, workplace of choice is something that I take a lot of pride in. And again, it's, uh, 
It's about the employees. That's the first link in the value chain. So let's stick with the, the development and coaching theme for just a little bit. So as I mentioned, you have very generously mentored two of our students as part of the Neely Mentorship Program. What advice do you give to people who are just starting their careers or who are maybe <coughs> kind of early in their career um, in terms of their development and, and career progress? Well, first off, uh, you know, be patient, right? Uh, a lot of the kids, it's my kids especially, you know, they grew up uh, in, in a society of uh, instant gratification, mm -hmm. right? Everything comes fast. And uh, you know, my kids, obviously, they grew up in the suburbs. And they didn't have to worry about where their next meal you know, is coming from. Even though you know, my wife and I really tried to instill you know, great values, at the end of the day, I mean, they, they, were, they were pampered. You know what I mean? Although we didn't pamper them, our coaches didn't pamper them, um, uh, our, our teachers didn't pamper them, but they kind of lived a little bit of a pampered lifestyle. And so they're starting to find out now that, oh my god, yeah, it does take a lot of time mm -hmm. to become CEO of a company, right? Mm -hmm. Careers aren't linear, and like I said earlier, um, you might think you know what, what, what you want to do, but uh, be open, I would say, is, is, is rule number one. Just be open mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and let things come to you. But once you do start working, be an expert. Help others do their job better. You know, as a teammate, that was my job. As a point guard, I needed to make sure that my teammates um, you know, got better, right? Uh, and that was a big transition for me because when I got recruited, I was a two guard. I loved to shoot, you know. And uh, remember, I said I love to see my name in lights. Well, I like, you know, I like to shoot. And uh, you know, playing uh, point guard, coach would always say, you know what? I need you to get the team going. I need you um, to get the offense moving. And uh, and that was a very difficult transition. But now, when I think about it in business, it's the exact same thing. You know, it's about um, getting others get, you know, to get started, right? And so um, I would say. Be patient, number one. Number two, um, when you start working, um, make others around you better. Mm -hmm. Make people want to be around you. Um, uh, you do that by becoming a subject matter expert. I'll give you a really you know, clean example. When I was growing up, my first job, I worked at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. My dad was um, uh, chief of a security after 30 years in the military, right? And uh, I would take over. Um, um, People, when they, when they took vacation, I would take their, their job for a week, right? Mm -hmm. So one week I might be a security guard, the next week I'm a custodian, okay? And uh, which one do you think I like the most? Being, being the security guard, right? I got to you know, walk around, had a badge, you know, and get to punch the clock a little bit, you know, felt really good. I hated being a custodian. And one of the jobs that I had to do, which I hated, was cleaning the men's and ladies' restrooms. Horrible experience. Horrible experience, okay? And, and of course, I would go in and I would half ass some things, right? I wouldn't quite do everything very well, and so my dad would come behind me and inspect. Of course, he's, the, uh, he, he's on the night watch, and so um, he's going to treat me a little bit differently than the average person, right? Because, you know, he wants to make sure that uh, I'm doing a job. And, I mean, he would literally kick my butt because I just didn't do a very good job of cleaning the restrooms, right? So he made me go back and do them again and do them again and do them again. And so... Anyway, the, the lesson or the moral of the story is, and, and this is what he said to me you know, uh, uh, at a very early age, no matter what you do in life, do it well. If you're going to be a custodian, and guess what? We had custodians, and they were much better than me at the time, right? But take pride in what you do. Um, if you don't want to be a custodian, then go do something else. Um, if you don't like being an accountant, go do something else. If you don't like to pay as a, uh, uh, as a teacher, Go do something else, okay? But don't bring the rest of the world down with you. Be an expert at what you do and make other people better, is what I would say to uh, some of that. the students. That's great. <coughs> okay, so we said the first prong was employee development. Second prong is business strategy. Mm. Um, and a big theme of a lot of what we talk about at Neely all the time is the pace of change right now in the business world. So can you give us one or two examples of how you recommend companies ensure that the workforce is equipped with the necessary skills and knowledge to thrive in this crazy business environment that we're in. Well, one of the things that we do is we, um, we follow trends, obviously, right? We have to, and we try and anticipate what's coming around the corner and uh, try and anticipate uh, what the future looks like. And so, you know, right now, um, electrification is, uh, is, a, is a big buzz buzzword in, in, in our industry. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, our employees are fully immersed in uh, electrification technology and what it is as a company that we're trying to uh, do in the marketplace. And so 
Um, we walk the talk, and, and the only way to get uh, you know people to uh, believe in what we do is that we try to baptize them in you know our strategy. And uh, and so just recently we had a a, a, a massive massive um, I would say um, retreat uh, where we talked a lot about electrification, hydrogen propulsion, the things that we're working on. Um, because sometimes we take it for granted. You know, I'm in, the, I'm, I'm in the boardroom every single day and we're talking about electrification, we're talking about, you know, the new facility or the plant that we're building in uh, Savannah, Georgia as we speak. And, you know, sometimes I forget about, you know, those frontline employees that really don't know all the things that I know, right? And so immersing these uh, employees in uh, what we're trying to do as a company um, is really, really important. In fact, we probably need to do more of it. Uh, we, we usually do it once a year, but uh, you know, my team and I have talk, talked about, about hey, let's, let's figure out how do we do this two, three, four times a year to ensure that you know, people really get what we're trying to accomplish in the marketplace. And so um, just not taking uh, for granted that people know everything that I know. Yeah. Uh, and so the only way to do that is uh, to throw people out there and let them experience you know, um, driving a, an EV, taking EVs home. I drive an EV. Um, I have a level two charge in my home, which is a game changer. I don't think I'll ever go back to uh, an ICE uh, internal combustion engine uh, type vehicle. Why would I? Um, because I've got you know, all the creature comforts in my EV, uh, and I absolutely love it. Um, and if you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint, which by the way, we're trying to be carbon neutral by 2045, it's gotta be done through EVs. You know, I know right now a lot of people are uh, looking at hybrids, and we've got some of our key competitors that are pushing hybrids, right, instead of uh, EVs. Um, but, but, but making sure that our employees are the best EV brand ambassadors that they can be. And so the only way to do that is through extensive and proper training. That's a great answer. Yeah. Okay, I said we were going to get to what it's like to work for a Korean company. So what's the difference between a Korean company and an American company? Mm. Well, I think, um, you know, just going back to what I said is, um, you know, we, we look for opportunities to, to, uh, to poly poly, to move, you know. There's two things that we do. One is poly poly, we move, we go fast. The other is uh, midi midi, which is, um, which is uh, proper planning. We do probably more poly poly than midi midi, because that's the culture of the company. Um, but uh, the big difference I would say is that um, um, with, with a Korean car company, anything is possible. Anything is possible, and that you, you, you actually feel that every single day when you walk into the building. Um, um, we're big risk takers. Uh, we're not very conservative. Um, we've tried many things. Some things work, some things don't work. But if they don't work, you know, we dust ourselves off and we go and try again. Um, Haboja, you know, have you tried? Um, that's a big part of our culture. Um, when I was working at General Motors, and I love working for GM. I learned a lot. You know, it gave me my start in the uh, auto auto business. Um, but GM was a very, I would say, um, conservative car company, a very mm -hmm. slow car company. Uh, it had been around for 100 years, obviously, uh, huge legacy costs. Um, and because it, there were so many employees, um, I think it was tough to, for them to adjust and, and, and mm -hmm. shift with the, uh, with the times. Whereas with uh, Hyundai, we're very flexible, we're very nimble. Um, give you a really good example. Um, when we went out to purchase the property in, uh, in Savannah, Georgia to build our new meta plant, I don't know if you guys are fully aware, but we've got our second uh, manufacturing footprint being developed right now in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Um, 30,000 acres. Um, it's going to employ roughly about 8,500 people. It's all part of our uh, $12.6 billion investment in the United States. We're going to bring uh, 8,500 high paying, uh, high, technolo uh, uh, high technology um, uh, manufacturing jobs to the, uh, to the United States. 8,500, you know, we're very proud of that. Two battery plants that are going to go right alongside the uh, meta, meta plant facility, and if you add those jobs, another 1,500. So um, a huge footprint in, uh, in Savannah, Georgia. But uh, when we went out to uh, look for property, um, um, it was myself, uh, the global COO, and the executive chair, Mr. Chung. And, um, you know, we're walking and looking at property, and um, we finally found a piece of land and, um, you know, well, I won't get into the, uh, the details in terms of the cost and whatnot, but uh, bottom line, the executive chair said, okay, buy it. Just like that, without any kind of a board meeting, um, just, you know, on the spur of the moment, this is what we're going to do, you know, $12.6 billion later and uh, we're going to be up and running in Q th uh, Q4 of this year. Yeah. Um, phase one, we're going to be able to produce 300,000 cars. Phase two, 500,000 cars. Oh, wow. And, um, um, you know, again, it's all part of our, you know, EV strategy going forward and becoming carbon, carbon neutral. But 
again, having an executive chair that can make that decision, Johnny, on the spot, mm -hmm. without you know overanalyzing and trying to figure out. I mean, we've talked about what we're going to do and how we were going to do it, but uh, uh, he 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 always wants us to lead and be a leader and not a follower. Um, and so that's that's really part of the culture. It's like, hey, let's get out there and lead. Let's be number one in the marketplace. Not necessarily in volume, but let's. Uh, Let's anticipate where the uh, car industry is going to go, and let's try to meet the customer on their journey towards electrification, on their journey towards um, hybrid systems. So at this new plan, it's mostly going to be electric cars that are being built? Right now, uh, the plan is 100% EV, although wow. we're studying you know, how we can bring maybe more hybrids into uh, that facility mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's for Hyundai Genesis as well as Kia. Um, Kia is our sister brand. Uh, because of antitrust laws, um, we don't talk to Kia in the United States. We all ladder up to the executive chair in Korea, but uh, we keep the two car companies separate. And so we compete, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, so Hyundai, Genesis, and Kia will come out of that uh, facility. And right now it's 100% EV. Well, that's great. Like, you know, there's people argue about electric vehicles versus gas. It kind of doesn't matter, right? Because companies are moving in a direction and consumers are moving right. in a direction and yeah. Um, okay. And it's gotten very political right now, you know. Yeah. The Democrats want EVs, the Republicans don't want EVs, you know, and blah, blah, blah. I try not to get any of that, you know, red and blue stuff. Uh, I like the color of green, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, my, that's, that's my color, mm -hmm. right? So from a business perspective, uh, that's all that I worry about. Although we are looking at two different scenarios. We're looking at a, you know, a Biden scenario. We're looking at a Trump scenario, depending on who wins the election, right? Um, because we got a plan, mm -hmm. right? We sure. have to plan for it. And, um, you know, even if a Republican comes into office, he physically can't change a lot of the EPA and regulations until 28 calendar years. So the uh, trajectory for EVs and the adoption rate will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now we're doing quite well. You know, Tesla right now is King Kong, mm -hmm. um, but they're starting to lose market shares. More entrants come into the market. Um, their stock price is dropping right now, you know, and um, um, here's my advice to you. If you got Tesla stock, get rid of it. Um. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Hope Elon is not in the <laughs> audience somewhere. We didn't invite him. We didn't invite him. Yeah. Very he's, he's not a frog, so we don't want him here. But uh, anyway, um, you know, we're going to continue to lead in that space. And um, um, if you're going to reduce your carbon footprint, you're going to have to do it through electrification. Um, if you want to, you know, do something that's uh, good for the for the environment, you're going to have to do it through electrification. Yeah. So we believe, uh, you know, EV is definitely the future, uh, but we know it's still going to be very fragmented. Um, um, you know, you're still going to need pickup trucks to, uh, you know, from a commercial perspective yeah. to a haul and people still want to pull boats and their trailers and that type of thing. And so over time, the technology will, will continue yeah. to improve. Um, but right now, I think we're in a really good space. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yes. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to switch to some okay. audience questions. Some audience questions. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> the first one is a reminder to me. Um, we'll go back to that one. Uh, so there has been a lot of debate recently on the clean energy transition to EVs. Hmm. Hyundai has been very successful with some great EVs. How do you believe hmm. the EV market will evolve? You talked about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we're doing, as I said earlier, we're, we're doing really, really well. Uh, we're number two right now in terms of EV sales. Uh, in fact, last month, uh, we sold over 12,000 uh, EVs. Our uh, Ionic 5 was up 54% year over year. Ionic 6 was up 788% year over year. And our Kona EV was up 11% year over year. Um, and so we're doing really, really well in the marketplace. We've got a couple of uh, EVs that, uh, that we're going to be launching in the, fu in the, in the very near future. Um, but for us, it's really about uh, getting the cost out of uh, the production cycle or the manufacturing cycle because producing EVs is, um, is uh, very, very expensive. Um, and then not only, not everybody can afford some of the EVs that we're uh, launching in the marketplace. Most of our EVs are priced, uh, you know, 30000 and above. Yeah. Uh, well, for the average uh, consumer, you know, everybody can't afford an EV, right? So we've got to figure out how to bring um, more mainstream, lower-priced EVs into market, which is something that we're studying as we speak. Um, but uh, I think the adoption rate will continue to improve, especially as the infrastructure continues to improve. Uh, in California, in the coastal markets like California, Washington, Oregon, New York, New Jersey, and some of those areas, uh, Philadelphia. Um, the infrastructure is very robust. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a place like Texas, you know, it's not very robust, right? So the adoption rate is going to be a little bit slower here than it is in California, right? So any grocery store you go to in California, you're going to see a level three uh, supercharger right there in the parking lot, right? 
Here, you probably won't see it as much, and so the adoption rate will be a little bit slower. Here, you know, we're going to probably sell more hybrids initially um, because people want to slowly make their way towards, you know, an EV versus just diving right in. Um, but make no mistake about it, the uh, trajectory is going to continue to grow. So, uh, but the market will be fragmented uh, over the next decade. Um, ICE vehicles will still play a, a major, major role. They'll still be very, very important. But uh, over time, we're going to continue to, uh, you know, push the envelope and uh, be a leader in that space. The other thing I would say, there's a threat that's on the horizon that a lot of people don't like to talk about in the U.S., and that's the Chinese. Mm. Um, the, uh, the Chinese brands are light years ahead of us in terms of uh, EV technology. Um, if anyone has ever been to China, and I had to work in China when I was in Japan quite a bit. In fact, I was uh, working in Wuhan, which is where the virus broke yeah. out, if anybody remember. Maybe I was uh, patient one, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, when, when you spend some time in China, you recognize the smog levels are just, they're real. I mean, you know, when you can't see yeah. from here to that door because yeah. the smog is, uh, it looks like it's gonna rain outside, and it's not, it's just smog, it's just mm -hmm. trash, it's dirt. They, they, they had to make a difference. Uh, they had to change. Otherwise, you know, people aren't going to survive. And mm -hmm. so um, they are light years ahead of us in terms of technology, manufacturing. They've taken a lot of costs, and they're very competitive. I mean, they, they design some really good products. Um, they've got some great EVs. Uh, they've already disrupted the auto industry in Europe, uh, and they're starting to uh, disrupt the auto industry in South America. Of course, our administration right now is we're giving them the Heisman. We're trying to keep them out of the U.S., which is fine. Uh, but from a Hyundai perspective, I welcome the competition. You know, steel sharpens steel. No different than when I was playing basketball at uh, TCU and chasing Jamie around every day in practice. You know what I mean? Um, my job was to help him get better, right? And his job was to help me get better. Um, unfortunately, he got better than me, so um, it didn't work out uh, as well as I would have hoped. But I, th I think uh, it turned out okay. For I you. think it turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we know that 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 Chinese threat is on the horizon, and so we're preparing for the future. And again, we've got to continue to take cost out of the equation and produce cars that, uh, you know, people can afford around 20 to 25,000 bucks, you know. And so, um, you know, at some point, they'll probably, uh, you know, make their way into the United States. But until they do, uh, we want to prepare for the future, so. That's interesting. We ha obviously have a very astute audience here, but I'm guessing if you ask the average person out on the street if China is a major threat in the automotive industry, they would probably not think of them as so. Major, major threat, yeah. <clears throat> especially uh, especially in the EV space. And so, you know, one, one, of, one of the other things that we're doing as a company, we're partnering with uh, six other automakers, uh, General Motors, BMW, Stellantis, Mercedes, Kia, Hyundai, um, to help improve the infrastructure in the United States and add more charging mm -hmm. stations, right? It's no different when the uh, the Model T was you know was, was first born you know over a hundred years ago. I think you could go maybe uh, 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 three miles, I think it was, or something like that, right? You couldn't travel from you know Dallas to say New Mexico uh, in a Model T back in the day because you people would run out of gas. From Dallas to Fort Worth. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you could you couldn't go from downtown to downtown. You couldn't go 31 miles, and so uh, because the infrastructure wasn't there, right? But then what happens over time? All these gas stations started to pop up. You got them on every corner, and now you know people have confidence when they drive a, uh, a gasoline car that they can go from New York all the way to California if they choose, or down to Florida and not run out of gas. Well, it's the same thing with ele with uh, electric uh, uh, with electrification. Uh, once that infrastructure starts to improve, um, people will uh, have less range anxiety. They'll be a little bit more confident driving an EV, and uh, uh, and you're doing something good for the environment. So, what's wrong with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this next question is, I, I think, from a student, Presley Mills, um, and uh, it's going to put you on the spot a uh -oh. little bit, but I think it's a really good question. What is How your biggest... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to ask it really slowly? Yeah, so go ahead. Have to answer. <laughs> what is your biggest failure, and how did you bounce back? Man, I haven't failed in anything I've ever done. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, my biggest failure... Um, I'll be honest with you, you know, um, I wish I would have taken school um, more seriously. Um, I didn't start taking my education seriously until my junior year in, in, uh, at TCU, to be honest with you. My proudest moment was when I tested out of two of my um, uh, finals uh, as a junior, and I did it again as a senior. No way in hell I would have done that my freshman and, uh, and my sophomore year, because I just didn't take uh, education seriously. I think I would have been a lot further along had I been a better student. Um, I would say that's probably one of my biggest challenges growing up. You know, being a student athlete was uh, was very challenging. You know, very demanding. 
Um, we spend a lot of hours in the gym. You know, your body is tired. You know, mentally you're tired. Um, but yet, you know, the professors don't care. You know, and um, you still got to go to class. You still got to do your homework. Uh, and the expectation here at TCU is pretty high. You know, and so I didn't. I, I really didn't recognize that until my junior year. So. Uh, um, um, if I had to do it all over again, I would have uh, I would have been a better student. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think I would have been a lot further along today, uh, because everything I, I you know for me it's 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 been learned behavior over time. You know, experiences and failures and successes over and over and over again. But I think if if I would have just been a better student back in the day, I would have uh, I would have been a, been a lot further along. So what prompted the switch? What made you go, okay, now I need to, I need to focus on academics It's just, more. it was maturity, yeah. you know? Um, you know, you start to recognize that, hey, wait a minute, you know what, uh, in another year, I've got to get out and go find a job because I, I wasn't good enough to play in the NBA. I knew, I, I knew my basketball career was gonna end um, at the end of uh, TCU, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I had to figure out, okay, what am I gonna do next, right? And so I didn't wanna let my dad down, you know, because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, he couldn't pay for me to go to school, you know, so thank God I got a basketball scholarship and I wanted to make sure I took advantage of that uh, and not let him down. And so um, I think mentally I just, I, I, could, I could feel a shift, you know. I, uh, I started to engage in, in the classroom a lot more. I started to uh, study a lot more and, and studying became fun, you know. Uh, but it wasn't fun my, uh, my freshman and sophomore year. Doing some really crazy and goofy and crazy things. I see uh, Rodney Higgs sitting in the back back there, you know, he, you know, we, we what did you say, Rodney? We survived. <laughs> we survived. And uh, again, I just wish I would have taken it uh, a lot more seriously. But I think it was maturity that uh, really changed me. Yeah. Okay, this next question is a really good one, too. Completely different topic. Ah. With so many technological advancements available, how do you pr prioritize what should go in the next car? <sighs> well, we listen to the customer. You know, um, the customer is the center of the universe. And um, the other thing that we try to do is, is anticipate things that the customer will need that they don't know that they'll need today, right? Uh, if you really think about like heating, heated seats, mm -hmm. uh, cool uh, air conditioned seats, who would have thought, you know, back in the day that uh, that was really important, right? Well, it is, or heated steering wheel, mm -hmm. right? Really, really important. Um, uh, the, safety that, the, the safety technology that we uh, put in the vehicles today uh, to ensure that, you know, consumers can, you know, obviously nobody in here texts and drive, do they, right? Nobody's texting and driving, right? Of course not. Um, but we have technology in the cars today that you can literally take your hands off the wheel, look and grab a phone. Not that I condone that, okay? <laughs> Please don't walk out of here and say, well, Randy Parker said, no, <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. But the good news is, is that we've got technology that can help protect the driver um, from himself yeah. or from herself. And so um, that's what we try, try and figure out. And, and we try to anticipate what you might need before you even know that it's good for you. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Um, and Ray, we know that, that, that traffic accidents, uh, mortalities from, from driving have decreased. That's right. Proportionally, even as, because of the, right, technology. the number of, yeah, that's even right. as the number of, of drivers has increased. Um, okay, let's see, one more question. Um, there has been a, oh, no, we asked that one. Okay, wait. Okay, over the past year, auto logistics have changed with a shift to land bridge via rail, U.S. West Coast to the east. How long does the land bridge continue? Um, well, the good news for, uh, for, for Hyundai is that uh, we're a fully integrated company. And so we have a, a logistics company, it's called Glovis. Um, we, uh, uh, we own uh, uh, huge shipping yards throughout the, U, uh, the, uh, uh, the globe, uh, here in the US, here in Korea. We've got huge shipping vessels that uh, we leverage uh, around the world. In fact, other manufacturers leverage us uh, to uh, ship their product. So uh, from a land bridge perspective, um, I think it's going to still be here in the next, say, 10 to 20 years. I mean, I don't see that uh, changing anytime soon, you know. Um, but you can see how vulnerable we are given, you know, the, uh, the bridge that just collapsed in, uh, in Baltimore, right? Yeah. Um, by the way, one of, uh, it wasn't one of our uh, <laughs> shipping boats, thank God. Um, but um, um, I think that land bridge uh, 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 process will still be here for quite some time. Yeah. 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 But one thing I, I will tell you that, uh, that we're working on, flying taxis. Speaking of land bridging, right? Um, uh, we've got a subdivision called Supernal. Um, they're based out of Irvine, California. And uh, by the end of 2028, 
as long as we can get the uh, regulations approved, um, we'll have flying taxis, you know, wow. and uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, what car company does that? Again, going back to, you know, making progress for humanity. Um, think about anybody from California? So you know about the 405 freeway? The 5 freeway, it's a disaster, right? I mean, to try to get from Irvine to downtown LA can take you, in some cases, two hours, right? Uh, but think about being able to go from Irvine or Newport Beach to downtown LA or a Dodger game in five minutes, right? Using hydrogen and uh, electrif electrification uh, propulsion uh, or electric propulsion. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. I've already seen the prototype. Um, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, so when you think about land bridging, um, to me, that's, that's, that, that's what's cool about, you know, working for a car company like Hyundai because, again, it's more, more than just a sheet metal. It's more about, you know, the products that we sell in the here and now. It's about what, what, what we're capable of in the future. Okay, I think we're going to have to get you back and you're going to have to bring <laughs> some of these things with you and let be us see Be happy to. <laughs> We'd be happy to. Okay, we're at 9 o'clock. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much. This has been a fantastic conversation. We talked a little bit at lunch, and he is going to get to watch the, the solar eclipse. And I just want to remind you that you all have eclipse viewing glasses at your seats so that you can take part of, right, we really deliver here. We get you the, the CEO of Hyundai, and we get you an eclipse all in one day. All in one day. That's, that's we made that TCU appointment. and the Neely Promise. <laughs> So please join me in thanking Randy.